Uh, hello, uh, welcome to a new Libertarian Alliance meeting. Uh, tonight the uh, speaker is Jan Lester, and the topic is a new paradigm Libertarian reply to some Rothbardian criticisms on intellectual property, the non-aggression principle, and pre-proprietarian pre -proprietarian liberty. Uh, with that I'll hand it over to you, Jan. Thank you, literally. Yes, <laughs> right. <clears throat> Andy Curzon replied in an ongoing debate with Lee Weeks, which Mr Weeks forwarded with approval to the Libertarian Alliance Forum. And this response replies to those criticisms. Uh, a very few cuts have been made to avoid some repetitions and irrelevance. Um, however, just as Mr Curzon sometimes repeats his main points in slightly different ways in the hope that some of them might prove cogent, so this reply does the same. Uh, in this context, the dialogue-like result seems to engage more directly and completely than producing a standalone exposition. There is no more to say. Oh, it's a good way to start, I think. <laughs> because you keep replying words to the effect of this quote from your sent reply. Good ideas are scarce, i.e. limited, because if they were not, they would already exist. I respond. The word idea is ambiguous and too suggestive of a link to minds. Hence, it seems preferable to adopt meme to help mnemonicize Karl Popper's three worlds ontological categories theory. World one, matter, all that is physical. World two, minds, all that is conscious. World three, memes, all materially encoded abstractions. To which, therefore, it seems necessary to add an immaterial or atemporal world naught, here called modes, all abstractions. Not all memes are or have been or ever will be ideas in any mind. A book of computer-generated logarithms or poetry or patterns, etc., might contain materially encoded abstractions that have never been consciously perceived. Only an infinitely small fraction of world modes will ever be instantiated in world one matter or perceived in world two minds or recorded in world three memes. Scarcity then relates to memes in at least three ways. One, the number of useful or any memes is scarce, not infinite. Two, each meme is about only one mode, abstraction or intellectual object. Three, ownership, right of use of con and control of any particular meme is itself scarce. Ownership is scarce, like ownership of any particular piece of matter, such as land. Four, the production via discovery, invention or creation of a meme requires the use of scarce resources, even if mainly thought and time. That's outlining the approach I'm taking and now we get back to a more dialogue like interaction. This is a quotation. That is missing the point of why scarcity is important, linked in with their physical boundaries. Of course ideas are not limited. If they were, then show me their limits. Show me the limits of one single good idea. The same meme, materially encoded mode, might be expressed in many physical ways, each of them physically limited, of course, but the mode itself that the meme captures is an abstraction, and so does not have physical boundaries. It has abstract boundaries. Pythagoras' theorem is not pi, and it is easy to distinguish them. And when you say good ideas are scarce, i.e. limited, because if they were not, they would already exist, Think about applying this to anything. It is ridiculous. The whole point of practical scarcity is that it does apply to things that exist. Particular memes are often known, i.e. grasped by minds, to exist. Unknown modes are not yet known to exist, but they already have abstract existence and objective qualities, such as a number that has never yet been thought of or written down, but which is entailed by the existence of numbers. Good ideas are known, useful memes. Scarcity, scarcity relates to them in the senses already outlined, but they are collectively less scarce thanks to the incentive effects of intellectual property, 
although some people do not require that incentive, of course. So I hear your song that you have IP protected and then want to play it on my guitar. But I am a stopped from this in law. What right does anyone have to stop me plucking whatever strings I choose to so long as it is my guitar? They have a right because you thereby make use of somebody else's property, namely their intellectual property. Although some uh, personal uses are often not a practical concern. One may not use one's property of, of whatever type to trespass on other people's property of whatever type. It is not possible to refute intellectual property by simply presupposing that only physical, object, only physical property is real property. Liberty, as in the nap, i.e. if the nap is not broken in any way, one has liberty or autonomy. How does the nap non-aggression principle relate to interpersonal liberty or autonomy? It doesn't mention either. Can only apply to physical goods, because when I see, hear, use your idea, you have not lost out. If the owners of claimed property or uh, uh, claimed ownership of intellectual products, uh, if their ownership is not observed, then that is an immediate loss to the would-be owners, or they wouldn't be would-be owners. Very soon, such uncivilised meme communism would be a loss to everyone. Imagine a world from 1,000 years ago where everyone's ideas were protected. We would be centuries behind where we are now. Innovation would be stifled. This ignores or fails to grasp, first, the new paradigm libertarian limit on intellectual property duration, which is probable or actual independent production, and second, the incentive effect of allowing such IP. Lester thinks we must have a theory of liberty before a theory of property. There are infinite possible property rules. Some property rules fit into personal liberty and most do not. Only a separate theory of liberty can distinguish the two. The basic libertarian conception of interpersonal liberty does not need to mention property. It is about people not being proactively constrained by each other more than is unavoidable, at least. But liberty is a negative concept, not a positive concept, as agreed by both Leicester and anti-IP people. It seems as though a negative concept can often be reworded into a positive concept, so this does not appear to be a very substantive point. One cannot have liberty to do everything, otherwise that would extend to hurting other people and such. In the Lockean sense, one can have the interpersonal liberty to do everything that one wishes with, with, within one's abilities, resources, etc. Proactively hurting other people is license or power rather than liberty. So what I mean by negative is that it is the freedom not to infringe on anyone else's liberty. That is an obscure sentence. Is it supposed to explain negative freedom or negative liberty? In one sense, everyone has the freedom not to infringe on anyone else's liberty, but they sometimes do it anyway. In any case, freedom and liberty are synonyms in English, so they cannot be uh, usefully contrasted or used to explain each other, if that is what is intended, except by stipulating a difference, such as Hobbesian physical freedom versus Lockean interpersonal liberty. I have read everything Lester writes on this, I think, and he goes round in circles. Rothbardian and Nozickian libertarianism circles around various key ideas without ever clearly relating them to interpersonal liberty. By contrast, the new paradigm libertarianism ultimately relates everything back to a theory of liberty. So libertarianism, as far as the modern conception is concerned, is the nap or consent axiom. This does not explain how interpersonal liberty as such relates to either the NAP or the consent axiom. Abstractly theorised, interpersonal liberty can be interpreted 
as the absence of people's proactive constraints on each other's chosen goals or preference satisfactions. However, this abstract interpretation doesn't mention property or law, for it is a contingent matter whether property, and if so, which forms, will best fit it. In the world we live in, it does indeed appear that self-ownership, proactive constraint minimising private property, voluntary transfers, consensual activities, cons contracts, etc., facilitate such liberty. But in order to be philosophically clear, the contingent nature of these various connections needs to be acknowledged and explained. Here I go back to the fact that no one is losing out once an idea has been created. And as such, it is not aggressive for me to adapt your idea since you can still use the idea whether I do so or not. I really don't see how this can be logically ignored. Here is a reply from the chapter on IP in the second edition of Arguments for Liberty. Consider a physical analogy. Suppose I build a machine that can produce widgets using air and natural light. The machine is also powered by air and natural light and never needs repairing. I switch on the machine and in seconds I have a month's supply of widgets to sell in the nearby market. When I am not around, you come along and use the machine to make the same number of widgets and you promptly go and sell them in the market yourself. Furthermore, you intend to continue repeating the procedure because I am, somehow, unable to guard the machine adequately and you can always, somehow, beat me to the market. You assert that I have lost nothing because I still have access to my machine and to the widgets I made and to as many more widgets as I want. However, I didn't produce the machine or the widgets for my personal use. I produced them solely in order to have something to sell and now you have prevented that. Therefore, it is clearly false to claim that I have lost nothing and that my incentive to make such machines has not been undermined. And this appears to be sufficiently analogous with the position of many people who produce ideal objects with the intention of claiming them as intellectual property. So when you say, as Jan Lester argues, libertarians attempt to justify property rights by various arguments, but they don't have an explicit theory of liberty, this is hogwash, since libertarians' theory of liberty is precisely the freedom to use one's body and property as one chooses. That is the liberty they explain. So, liberty is supposed to be the freedom to use one's body and property as one chooses. But as I said, liberty and freedom are synonyms, so they can't really be used to explain each other. And this does not explain how, exactly how, to use one's body and property as one chooses is liberty in itself. It looks more like what, is, what usually fits theoretical liberty in practice. Theoretical liberty itself is more like the absence of interpersonal proactive constraints. Moreover, the offered libertarian's theory of liberty is silent on which of the infinite possible property rules are meant. Presumably only the ones that fit liberty, but we are given no theoretical criterion for this. Therefore, there is no proper libertarian's theory of liberty here. It isn't even wrong, as Wolfgang Pauli used to hyperbolize about confused theories in physics. It conflates the practical and the theoretical by tacitly relying on intuitions about what, in me what is meant. It is a very good example of hogwash unwittingly being presented as clarity. It is the equivalent of a socialist purporting to give a theory of human liberty in itself as free access to the goods one needs. Perfectly fits socialism, of course, but how does it relate to liberty? When he writes, how are the different kinds of property being distinguished as libertarian or not libertarian? No one claims property itself is libertarian. That would be absurd. But some kinds of property are usually libertarian in practice and some are not. How do we distinguish them? Libertarian is from the word 
liberty, which means freedom. Liberty means freedom and vice versa. But what is interpersonal liberty or freedom? So when Lester says, but libertarians usually have no explicit theory of what such liberty is, so they must have a tacit theory of liberty, he is plain wrong. The explicit theory of liberty is as stated, the allowance to use one's property, including one's own body, as far as one chooses, so long as it does not infringe on someone else's property. Three responses. One, the so-called explicit theory of liberty is an interpretation of liberty in practice. There is no explanation relating this to a genuine theory or concept or even definition of interpersonal liberty in itself. Two, this does not explain which kinds of one's property out of infinite possibilities this applies to. Presumably only property that fits into personal liberty. But which is that? Three, as it stands, any kind of status might agree with the account given. For instance, they might, and often do, say that once legitimate taxation is due, then one simply ceases to own that money. Once again, as explained, of course one cannot talk of liberty without talking of one's own body, property, or the other way around. Four responses. One, abstractly theorised, interpersonal liberty is people not proactively constraining each other. This would be true if, it was, uh, if we were, somehow, minds without bodies. Two, of course, we do have bodies, but one's body is not inherently property in a state of nature, for instance. Three, it is always a separate question whether and which and how certain kinds of property fit into personal liberty. Four, as to the other way round, clearly one can talk of one's own body without talking of liberty or even implying anything about it. For instance, my body is the phenotypical expression of particular genes. Liberty and property are inextricably linked. Property is possible without much interpersonal liberty in a totalitarian system, for instance. And liberty is possible without any property. If a group of people were to live together without property, but without interfering with each other or the things people are using, then they would all have maximal liberty. There is no need for a tacit theory of liberty when one has an explicit theory of it. Quite right but the alleged explicit theory is not even a real theory of liberty. Imagine if you signed a contract and then someone challenged something you did that was not prohibited by that contract and claimed this to be tacit. In fact, contracts typically always have tacit or implied aspects. Sometimes a court case is required to determine what is implied. That is why contracts are so good and can be applied even to intellectual endeavors. It is difficult to impossible to write an exhaustive and completely unambiguous contract. Language is broad and relies on shared tacit understanding. But basic property, whether physical or intellectual, does not in any case, uh, is not in any case based on contract theory. Now this is important, something you may not have considered yet. One of the reasons I am against IP, as well as it making no sense, is that in law it is pointless, and it is pointless, or better superfluous, precisely because of explicit contracts. Now if I write a book and make people who buy them explicitly sign a contract not to use more than, say, 100 words in a row from anywhere in the book, in uh, publishing or any other writing or something similar, then that is their choice before they buy or read the book. In the case of a book, and if such, and and as such, if they republish 100 words or more, they are breaking explicit parts of the contract. Do you see? So what is the need for IP law given this? There is none. This simply does not deal with people who are not party to the contract. Someone who finds a lost book or overhears it's being read or photographs a page over someone's shoulder, etc. One might as well say that physical property can be based on contracts alone. It would be necessary, but completely impracticable, to have contracts with everyone 
including future generations. The same can be applied to inventions or anything of an intellectual creation, and the same answer applies. He then gives an example of himself making a toy and binding everybody by contract and says, uh, I, th I think this is now clear. It's clear and clearly impractical. Any non-buyer who sees the toy can copy it. Continuing on with Lester's quote, when he writes, otherwise we could not explain why one kind of property is compatible with liberty while another is not, he is going down a stupid path because all property is within the remit of liberty. It is philosophically naive to conflate liberty and property and mainstream libertarian mainstream libertarianism conflates liberty, property and morals. But this is hidden by a delusion of being completely clear and simple. When Lester puts it looks as though there must be a tacit theory of pre propertarian liberty. Of course there need be no tacit theory, because we have a perfectly good explicit theory of liberty, NAP. In what? The NAP. NAP. Non-aggression non principle. Non-aggression principle. No, no, I just Yeah. The, the, the thing just yeah so. This something explicit has the obvious added benefit of being clear and objective, whereas things that are tacit have not been agreed upon explicitly by definition. The tacit theory that mainstream libertarianism presupposes has now been made explicit in the new paradigm. The truth of that explicit theory has nothing to do with anyone's agreement with it. This sounds like wordplay, but it is not. This is what is called the Hobbesian myth, i.e. by living under the remit of a monopoly state, we tacitly agree to do whatever we are told by the monopoly state. But no one has agreed to this explicitly, so how can it be so? The falsity of Hobbes's tacit political contract theory is irrelevant to the assertion that libertarianism entails a tacit theory of liberty in itself that can be made explicit. In any case, there is a true tacit social contract theory that people should associate without proactively imposing on each other. That is why people usually interact without fear and suspicion. I need not point out the illogicality behind this statement. And he quotes me, and if there is such a tacit theory, then it ought to be possible and should be enlightening to make this tacit theory explicit, other than just to quote it. There is no sense to this. I have nothing to say on this other than it is ludicrous, like me calling an apple a pear or a square a duck. What is the point? Tacit is tacit and explicit is explicit. Some things are tacit and what is tacit can often be made explicit. This is not any kind of illogicality. One might as well say that what is hidden cannot be revealed because hidden is hidden and revealed is revealed. The key is actual explicit agreement. The key to what? A real theory of liberty? How? Is this arbitrary? No. Otherwise, again, it could be claimed you tacitly agree to any number of things under the sun. It could, and some of them would be true and others false. People do tacitly agree to things. To go into a restaurant and order food, perhaps without even looking at the menu, is tacitly to agree to, agree to pay for it afterwards. The waiter never bothers to point this out. To offer something for sale is tacitly to imply that it is yours to sell and fit for its apparent purpose, and so on. For me, the heart of Leicester's inanity lies here. They write about being against initiated coercion or aggression as the implied opposite of liberty without explaining exactly how these are theoretically related to liberty. There is no problem explicitly relating the nap at all. If there is one, he should explain the problem. It is explained. 
it ought to be clear enough, but let's try again. The cited problem is relating the alleged libertarian non-aggression principle to liberty itself. The NAP holds that certain property rights are legitimate and then defines aggression of, as the flouting of those property rights. At no point does the NAP even mention liberty, let alone explain how this account relates to liberty. It is a negative rule to have interpersonal liberty. This doesn't explain what liberty is. Circles, circles, circles. As explained, the irony here is that it is Rothbardism that tries to explain itself by moving around non-aggression, explicit consent, legitimate property, self-ownership, homesteading, etc., without at any time providing an explicit theory of interpersonal liberty or how these things relate to it. They do relate to liberty, but it is left tacit or unexplained. It is like a utilitarian explaining consequentialism, the importance of maximising utility, the difference between act and rule utilitarianism, average versus total utility, and so on, without at any time explaining explicitly what utility is. But utilitarians don't usually do this. They usually tell you what theory of utility they are using, uh, whether it is some kind of happiness or pleasure or preference satisfaction or whatever. There is an embarrassing hole at the heart of mainstream libertarianism. There is no explicit theory of liberty in itself. So when he says, without explaining exactly how these are theoretically related to liberty, this is done by the NAP. Liberty is freedom to do what one wishes. This is the base theory of liberty, which I think no one disagrees with. There are two main theories of liberty in modern political philosophy. Each is drawn from a common sense conception of liberty. The individualistic and materialistic Hobbesian one is the absence of any constraints on a person. It is roughly the freedom to do what one wishes and it is more or less a zero sum theory by which liberties conflict and one person's gain in liberty is often another's loss. But strictly, Hobbes doesn't restrict it to other people as constraints. On this account, a slave owner has more liberty at the expense of his slave's liberty. However, this is not the base theory of liberty which no one disagrees with. <coughs> For there is also the social or interpersonal Lockean theory of liberty. That is roughly about people not being proactively constrained by each other. And in this sense, people's liberties are not at each other's expense. For the slave owner has proactive power over the slave, but no extra liberty thereby. Only some version of this Lockean sense of liberty is property, properly the libertarian one, although there are some Hobbesian libertarians, as we shall see. But because resources and land are scarce, we caveat this with so long as it does not infringe on other people's property. Under s the, logically, there's no end of possible property rules. Under some of them, chattel slavery is allowed. How, hence, the slave would be infringing on his master's property by running away. Therefore, the expression, so long as it does not infringe on other people's property, is tacitly assuming that such property is in accord with liberty in some libertarian sense, rather than flouting it. But we've been offered no independent theory of liberty by which to judge this. His next paragraph on coercion is just irrelevant, if not a mild straw man. No one I have heard of, anyway, claims infringement on liberty is based on coercion. Here's a handful of examples of some relatively well-known people using coercion to explain liberty or freedom. This is not to imply that they always or only use coercion in this way. One rather obscure bod called Murray Rothbard in The Ethics of Liberty, approving of another obscure fellow called Hayek on his definition of liberty says, 
F.A. Hayek attempts to establish a systematic political philosophy on behalf of individual liberty. He begins very well by defining liberty as the absence of coercion. That's uh, Ethics of Liberty 219. In capitalism, the unknown ideal, an obscure Russian emigre called Ayn Rand, or Alice Rosenbaum, writes, freedom in a political sense has only one meaning, then in inverted commas, the absence of physical coercion. In his Capitalism and Freedom, Milton Friedman asserts, political freedom means the absence of coercion of a man by his fellow man. In the philosophic thought of Ayn Rand, Douglas J. Den Yule and Douglas B. Rasmussen say, liberty is by definition an absence of coercion. And uh, ever the original thinker in the supreme importance of each human being, Tibor Macan also <laughs> says, liberty is by definition an absence of coercion. And if this use of coercion does not or did not happen relatively often with many libertarians, then why was this make complaint made on his blog by Stephen Kinsella? I must confess that one of my nits is the use by libertarians of the word coercion to mean aggression. Not that aggression is much clearer, of course, not without a very charitable interpretation and a proper theory of liberty. Coercion has been dropping out of use and the, people, the, the mainstream libertarians tend to stick to aggression nowadays and I do wonder if it's partly because I made such a fuss about coercion making no sense for a long time. Uh, but so they've retreated to aggression anyway. The criticisms continue. He then tries to use this straw man to talk of defence. As we have seen, it is not a straw man, and the remark about defence was a passing one, as was the one about coercion. Well, defence is another matter. Of course, if you steal from me and then you are punished, this technically infringes on your property, but that is what we have the law for. So many errors in one sentence. If someone steals, then it is not necessary within libertarian theory that he be punished. He needs to pay full restitution if the victim or his assigns require it. However, this can include a risk multiplier relating to the chance of evading detection, and some of it might be taken in the form of retributive restitution. This is covered in uh, Leicester 2015, Chapter 27, and Leicester 2012, Chapter 3. Neither does this entail that this infringes on your property, because if restitution is due from someone, then it is not infringing on his property to take it. That property has been forfeit. It might well be that many such matters would be dealt with via libertarian law, but it should be noted that observing liberty objectively entails that such restitution uh, is due prior to any legal system or even property itself but all such precise philosophical distinctions are lost within the crude conflationist cult of mainstream libertarianism. I am not claiming to have an exact position on the exact punishment for every aggressive action. Neither is anyone, theoretically. In fact, the theory of restitution in the cited chapters uh, do in principle claim to have an exact position on the exact restitution for every uh, illiberal action. This is an example of the comprehensiveness, precision and fecundity of the new paradigm. His point about fraud not being coercive is irrelevant because of the tie to property. One cannot engage in fraud without engaging in misrepresentation of property. The relevance is that the problem being discussed was whether the absence of coercion is sufficient to characterise libertarianism. And in normal English, such misrepresentation is neither an act of coercion, the use or threat of force to compel behaviour, nor aggression, the offensive use of force on a person. A lie about who wrote a book, for example, is also a misrepresentation of property, and thus illegal. As it stands, this is clearly false. Not just any lie about who wrote a book uh, would do. Some sort of misrepresented sale or passing off uh, must be intended here. Leicester really is highly muddled on so many levels. 
uh, it would appear that at least one of these competing accounts is highly muddled, though I certainly don't rule out some muddle in uh, what I know is a complex theory of interpersonal liberty. This assertion is then made prior to a quotation. This is, a totally, this is totally muddled and incorrect for reasons so obvious that they are not worth stating. All the errors uh, here I have expounded on before to you usually several times. Here is the quotation. What about aggression? There seems to be no similar inherent problem with saying that libertarians are aggre against aggression. The problem occurs when libertarians try to explain aggression, for they then typically do so in terms of acts that flout legitimate property rights. There are really four mistakes in one here. First, as it stands, this view is compatible with every system of property. They are all perceived as legitimate from within themselves. Second, to some extent, it appears to be circular. To simplify somewhat, aggression is flouting legitimate property, and le legitimate property is what is required without using aggression. And throwing self-ownership, homesteading, and labour mingling into the mix doesn't help. Third, there is also a conflation of the factual and the objective with the moral and the legal, for it ought to be possible to say what libertarian liberty is, in theory and practice, without at the same time insisting that it is by its very nature legitimate. Fourth, there is no independent theory of liberty from which it is possible to deduce what kinds of property are libertarian, whether or not they are legitimate. The following response is made. I mean, really, is he joking? Throwing self-ownership, homesteading and labour mingling into the mix does not help. Of course it does. These things are what allows for what property is. This response does not relate to the given discussion of liberty and aggression. It is also false. Property, in the sense being discussed, is something to which someone has legal title. This does not entail how that title arose. And property is logically possible without assuming self-ownership, homesteading and labour mingling. Admittedly, they may not be the best possible definition, but they are as logical and helpful as we have to date. They are not a definition of property at all. If applied, they give rise to a certain kind of property. How far that is libertarian is only possible to say with an independent theory of liberty. What a confused and silly paragraph. The way to refute a philosophical analysis is carefully to dissect it and show where the errors are. Instead, we are offered a confused, silly version of the very muddle that was being analysed. When he says, the fundamental sense of liberty or freedom that libertarianism implies is too abstract to be explained in terms of property, even self-ownership, first and foremost, this is precisely wrong. He is literally saying that liberty cannot be explained. So how would he explain this abstract thing? There is an explanation in chapter 10 of Leicester 2014, which moreover is what is supposedly being criticized here. But it is often useful to try again. In any case, there is a difference between a Hobbesian-esque approach and a Lockean-esque approach that also needs to be explained. In both cases, this is considering what interpersonal liberty is in theory and what it entails in normal practice as matters of fact. The moral status of liberty is an entirely separate question that is not discussed. So, a Hobbesian-esque approach. As we have seen, in terms of human actions, a Hobbesian-esque approach to interpersonal liberty is more or less zero-sum. If you have more liberty, then someone else has less. A slave owner, a slave owner has more liberty where and to the extent that his slaves have less. Such zero-sum interpersonal liberty cannot be maximised or protected. It can only be competed over or redistributed for some non-libertarian reasons, such as utility or equality. Therefore, it cannot be the liberty that most libertarians intend. However, if the subjective intensities of interpersonal constraints are taken into account, then this does seem to allow for a libertarian interpretation. 
these aren't interpersonal intensities beyond assuming that people are very broadly similar. For now, interpersonal liberty can be interpreted as being free from all people-imposed constraints on our preference satisfactions. That is, people don't stop us from getting what we want. If no one is constraining us in this way, then we have full interpersonal liberty. But people's preferences can clash. I might prefer to have you ultimately under my control, a uh, slave for short, although strictly slavery is a property concept, and you might prefer not to be my slave. In the event of such clashes, the most libertarian, that is, liberty-observing approach, is to opt for whichever one is the, whichever option is the lesser constraint. Almost universally, it is a greater constraint on one's preference satisfactions to be someone's slave than it is to be denied possession of a slave. If it were not, then people might take an evens gamble on being a slave for the chance of having a slave. But very few people would think that to be a prudent bet. People typically think that being made into a slave would be a disaster, and not owning a slave is, at most, a relatively minor constraint, especially as trade is far more productive than having slavery. Therefore, such liberty is maximally observed if people have ultimate control of their own bodies, and their bodies are more or less what they are. This factual consequence is before the legal institution of property needs to be assumed. However, an efficient way to protect this ultimate control of one's body is to assign property rights to declare self-ownership. A similar type of argument also applies to the control of all other resources. It is a greater constraint on our preference satisfactions for other people to deny us ultimate control of resources we objectively possess but do not yet own by use or by voluntary transfer, then it is to be denied free access to all resources, especially as that would result in an immediate tragedy of the commons. Again, this factual consequence is before the legal institution of property needs to be assumed, but in order to better protect uh, this control of such resources, it is efficient to have it, uh, property rights. In short, we can derive both self-ownership and private property roughly by initial use and thereafter voluntary transfer, because contingently, for we can imagine worlds where this is not so, they maximally observe such interpersonal liberty. They are not what liberty is, but what maximum liberty entails in practice. And once self-ownership and such property are thus derived from observing liberty, we can use those as rules as to what is libertarian in this case, factually, liberty instantiating. It is only necessary to go back to the abstract theory of interpersonal liberty to answer philosophical questions or occasional problem cases. It is now possible to make an additional and separate ideological observation. As almost everyone's rational, that is prudent, preferences lead in this direction, this then allows for a libertarian social contract on hobbesian esque assumptions, and this is more or less Jan Narveson's approach. But what about uh, pre propertarian liberty from a Lockean point of view, or at least a Lockean-esque point of view? Here, interpersonal liberty is interpreted as being free from people's proactively imposed constraints on our preference satisfactions. That is, people don't initiate interferences, whether intentionally or not, on our getting what we want. If no one is proactively constraining us in this way, then we have full interpersonal liberty. But now if someone enslaves me, that is pro, uh, proactively imposes ultimate control on me, then that is a co proactive constraint on me, on what I am. He is not thereby exercising his interpersonal liberty as he are conceived, but exercising power or license over another person. And if I manage to prevent my enslavement, I am not proactively imposing on my would-be slave owner, but merely reactively defending myself from him. Hence, ultimate control of oneself follows from observing such liberty as well. This factual and contingent consequence is again before needing to assume the legal institution of property, but in order to better protect it, we can institute self-ownership. When it comes to external resources, matters are also slightly different. 
Once we've begun to use a resource for some purpose, then it typically proactively constrains us significantly if someone attempts to seize that resource from us. By controlling it, we, we might proactively constrain him too, but more or less only to the extent of the unmodified resource's value to him. For to be denied a benefit that someone else has somehow produced is not to uh, be proactively constrained, uh, ignoring certain matters relating to envy, lost status, frustrated desire, etc. for the time being. Therefore, it is typically a lesser proactive constraint on people's preference satisfactions to allow ultimate control to the initial user, thereafter controlled by tra voluntary transfer, than it is to have common access to all resources and the consequent tragedy of the commons. This means that it maximally observes liberty to allow such personal ultimate control of external resources. Again, this factual and contingent consequence is before needing to assume the institution of property, but we can protect it by instituting property. In short, we can again derive both self-ownership and private property Uh, we can again derive both self-ownership and private property because contingently they maximally observe liberty. They're not what liberty is, but what maximum liberty entails in practice. In light of these two explanations of interpersonal liberty, two questions immediately arise. Are these two approaches fully equivalent in terms of what they entail in practice? And is one nevertheless to be preferred to the other for some reason? Both conceptions of interpersonal liberty appear at least initially to have the same practical results. And thus one could explain interpersonal liberty using either, and libertarians do use either. With the Hobbesian-esque approach, however, we would still have to say that a slave owner is having his liberty lessened if his slaves are freed. And um, Swalinski puts it this way. So he obviously goes along with the Hobbesian approach. Just as much, uh, just not as much as his slaves gain by being freed. Similarly, a would be person killer has less liberty if his target person escapes, just not as much as his target person preserves his liberty by escaping. This is a logically coherent, individualistic and egoistic approach, thereby very roughly in accord with Hobbes's outlook. However, it is not how people mainly think about interpersonal liberty, either as self-described libertarians or otherwise. People tend to think about interpersonal liberty in the more social Lockean-esque way. They typically think, that when someone escapes proactively imposed control, slavery, he gains more liberty, but his uh, previous controller or master has only lost power or license over him. And the would-be person killer does not have his liberty lessened if his target person escapes him. His target person's liberty is simply preserved. Hence, it is closer to the main libertarian and also more popular view to view liberty as being free from people's proactively imposed constraints on our preference satisfactions. And where a complete absence is impossible, because there is a clash of proactive constraints, either you suffer the pollution of my fire, or I suffer having no warmth and no cooked food. When there is such a clash, when uh, a complete absence is impossible, then liberty can only be maximised. It's very important not to misunderstand this final point. Dealing with clashes by maximising liberty might sound collectively consequentialist, at least in some non-moral sense. However, this can't be right, for no one's liberty is curtailed in order to promote the maximum liberty of others in general. It's just that maximisation is all that is possible when specific liberties clash. All that said, we can now mention morals, but only to make a factual point. For this Lockean-esque conception of liberty seems significantly more morally attractive to people as a matter of fact. And that fact 
probably means that it is more stable and less costly to preserve. Hence, more liberty would result. So that is one reason, one important difference, after all, a practical difference. However, there are, as mentioned, some Hobbesian-esque or Hobbesian libertarians. They call themselves Hobbesian, but obviously it's not exactly as Hobbes uh, explained himself. Although they would probably not give the same account as I give here. Jan Narveson and Hillel Steiner are contemporary examples, and so was the late Richard Garner. And there are also anti-libertarians that take a Hobbesian approach to liberty. The late G.A. Cohen appears to be an example. So it is useful to be able to explain all this. Doubtless, this important distinction could be further clarified and corrected, especially in response to criticisms. Perhaps it, but perhaps it is a better explanation than hitherto. It is possible that one of these approaches is logically incoherent, in which case it is good to have the other to fall back on. But if they are both logically incoherent, then that would probably mean starting again. For a tacit, pre propertarian conception of liberty seems necessary to distinguish forms of property that fit liberty from ones that don't. And so an explicit account should be, an explicit account should be possible. Recapitulated criticisms. I cannot be more explicit than I have been. So as a recap to reply to in bullet points, one cannot control what other people think and therefore, by Lester's own words, to own an ideal object or abstraction or meme is to have control over its use. This actually cannot be satisfied because one does not have control over what other people think. I thought scarcity was what you were not understanding but now I think it must be this. If you can refute this bullet point, please do, but at least directly address it. Tell me how you can stop me thinking something. Strictly, Lester should have written legal right of control over its use. And the flouting of a legal right does not mean that there is no legal right. Nevertheless, there are all sorts of practical limits on the control of intellectual property, as with physical property too. That cannot be perfectly protected either. But that does not undermine intellectual property insofar as it is practical. Fortunately, it does not in any case appear to be a practical problem for intellectual property that other people merely think about someone's intellectual property. A theory of property cannot be created without the use of some concept of liberty. Property is a legal right of use and control of something. Liberty doesn't need to be mentioned. And a theory of liberty cannot be created without some use of the concept of property. As we have seen, this is false. At the very least, the profit, sorry, the property of one's own body, as Lester admits, this was not admitted. Self-ownership is derived as a practical consequence of observing theoretical interpersonal liberty. The objective concept of property makes sense to apply in law because it is unequivocal in that it has physical boundaries or intellectual boundaries in the case of intellectual property. There is no argument about whether I have infringed on your property if I move your physical property or use it or use intellectual property without the owner's consent. The subjective concept of proactive imposition is impossible to determine, since anyone can assert that any proactive imposition, any action at all, can impose on them under any circumstances. For one thing, the concept of a reasonable person, as used in law, would need to be a practical limit on taking such assertions seriously and so with the likely long-term consequences of liberty. However, the main answer is that, as has been explained, once certain types of property have been derived as practically instantiating theoretical liberty, then those types of property become libertarian rules. We would at most 
depart from them only with very strong evidence that liberty was not thereby being preserved. This can be understood as a sort of rule libertarianism as opposed to act libertarianism. But it is initially factual or positive about the actual what actually instantiates liberty rather than moral or normative, an advocated principle. Apart from not being collectively consequentialist, it is analogous with the well-understood distinction between rule utilitarianism and act utilitarianism. Conclusion. In light of the above explanations, it seems correct to say that the fundamental philosophy involved with mainstream libertarianism is a refuted and degenerating research program. The philosophy involved with the new paradigm is an unrefuted and highly fruitful one. The main difference between current mainstream libertarianism and new paradigm libertarianism is that the mainstream version implicitly conflates liberty, property and morals, in particular rights, while the new version explicitly separates them and thereby offers a clearer understanding, better solutions to philosophical problems and more convincing replies to philosophical <laughs> criticisms. But a secondary significant difference that hasn't been discussed here is that mainstream libertarianism attempts various supporting justifications, while the new paradigm accepts that it is logically impossible to transcend a conjectural framework for all arguments, explanations, observations, and even inferences necessarily rest on assumptions. And so it uses the critical rationalist epistemology. However, despite these very important differences, new paradigm libertarianism is not fundamentally ideologically at odds with the mainstream, although that is often the mainstream misperception. Mainstream libertarianism is merely philosophically muddled and unsophisticated. Consequently, the new paradigm could take the well-trodden theoretical path of first being ignored, then ridiculed, then seriously criticized, then held to be merely arguing about words and really nothing more than was meant all along, and only finally accepted a significant theoretical prog progress. The final stage, at least, might require a new generation of libertarians. Thank you. Paul and then Nico. Yeah, it's probably quite good propaganda to rename your theory as the new paradigm. Um, <laughs> so that did occur to and, me. And to, and to play along with it, to play along with this outrageous conceit. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, I think I think what the what the old paradigm libertarians, or as we know the libertarians, uh, might, yeah. might might find uh, the nappers. Yes, the nap the nappers. Although you did talk about you nap the, if you want to. Well, there, there We're a, not for nappers. You had a number of opponents in sight, uh, not all of them the same. The Hobbes is not the same as the nappers. No, yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. The so nappers are a particular hard. You've got core. a little bit of yeah. confusion there, and you disagree with nearly all of them on intellectual property. Yeah. So you're quite separate on those yeah. things. Then. But um, <laughs> what I think they don't like about you is that although you make the theory of liberty much more explicit yeah. and clear, yeah. and you're doing philosophy, what they're more interested in is jurisprudence. And so while you make the theory clearer, you paradoxically make the law less clear and less obvious. So yeah. especially for the Nappers, the Rothbardians and the Dickens or whatever, they want to know that the libertarian judge you know, yeah. is you can see, you know, who's robbed who and that sort of thing there. Whereas yeah. you're muddying the waters by saying, ah, but we have to relate it back to, we have to go beyond property rights, which is an obvious legal concept, yeah. and look at the philosophy. And so they see, and so, although, what, what, there's a whole barrier of yeah. jurisprudence. There has to be, there has to be a lot, you have to have a lot of, in, in a libertarian society, there has to be a lot of reliable, philosophically trained judges mm. making an awful lot of legal precedents before they we can feel sure we're living in a libertarian society where libertarian rules are enforced yeah. in the of course. Mm. That's what they don't like. Yeah. Uh, of course, ultimately, 
they can accept <laughs> what I say and then ignore it, except for special occasions when somebody comes up with a philosophical yeah. criticism. For, for, because, as I said, self-ownership and certain kinds of property are libertarian. And all I'm saying is I've got an explanation as to why they are libertarian. How, but you're quite right to regard them as being libertarian, but they're libertarian in practice. They're not libertarian by definition. Uh, so all I'm doing is saying there's a philosophical explanation here and it is needed because there are philosophical critics like G.A. Cohen. Who, and you've got to be able to answer them. And a lot of people, in fact, uh, they're... Uh, and it's necessary to make this clear, this distinction. I, it, it only uh, recently uh, did it become clear to me that in uh, spoken exposition, I sometimes vacillated between a Hobbesian-esque approach and a Lockean-esque approach. And I thought, I've got to clarify what's going on here. Because clearly there are Hobbesian libertarians, yeah. and there are Lockean libertarians, and they're yeah, different. There are other kinds as well. And, yeah, but... but uh, um, yeah, the people who don't want to talk about anything no. but economics and yeah. so they don't even need to mention liberty because it's just confusing. Mm. And, uh, of course, people tend to focus on what they have in their area. And, I mean, I only claim to be doing the philosophy of it. And you don't have to. You, if you're an historian, you can just stick to the history. If you're an economist, you can stick to the economics and uh, sociology or legal theory or, uh, to, uh, you know, up to a point. But, uh, you know, there will, be, there will come a point, though, when a philosophical problem or criticism arises and you either have to say, well, that's not my area, uh, you know, or you try to reply to it. And uh, this theory uh, offers an explanation. Uh, but it, as I said, well, it can be accepted and, and then say, oh, is that all you're saying? That, that, that's why these things respect liberty. Then they, it sort of needn't be a big deal. It just, it sounds like a big deal because they immediately assume that, that it has to be a sort of act libertarianism and that at every stage you have to ask yourself, what can I do now that uh, proactively doesn't proactively impose costs on people. I've got to do some kind of no. That doesn't. That, that's just, that, that, that's never going to happen. We've got self ownership. We've got physical property. We move on from there, unless and until uh, uh, some big problem arises that has theoretical implications, such as um, what about the air supply or global warming? How? Do those relate to liberty and law? And then, again, there can be philosophical input there that it can explain it. Uh, so, really, I don't think they have anything to, f to fear, uh, yeah, except clarity. Uh, and they'll win over more people, because at the moment you have to browbeat people over the head with this circular account of libertarianism that... Don't mention the elephant that isn't in the room. The elephant is liberty, because we can't explain him. It is, he's not here. That's not right. You know, I was listening to the, the whole piece there, and you're saying that the Rothbardians, their position is that aggression is against intersubjectively inter verifiable. So they're saying material things. And so it, it's and, and material things that I gain without doing, imposing a... Uh, uh, Costs upon others, people of uh, others, physical property. I don't think that's uh, any different from what you're saying, except that again, it's a it's a juridical opinion of the matter, not a not a uh, not a rationalist. Uh, you know, that's all they're saying. They're saying it's, that's the, the reason you know the, the reason that it's work, doesn't work is because there's not a sufficient incentive if you only. Um, uh, prohibit imposition against physical property to form a polity that will actually produce a contract. With a normal Sorry, the reason that what doesn't work? Well, the reason the, the NAP, in other words. The NAP oh, right. So you're actually, you're, you're coming up with a, 
a criticism of the non-aggression principle? Is that what well, you're I'm saying? That, 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 that I don't think your criticism is correct. Correct. Yeah. Because, uh, but, I, 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 but I don't agree. With, in other words, I don't think it's right, but I don't think the criticism is right. Right, yeah. They're, they're, when they come out, you, you're saying that they're fuzzy, but it's, it's anything but. It's extremely clear. They chose intersubjectively verifiable property as the limit of property right? specifically because it's evident to people without a third party involved. Yeah. That's why they, so it's yeah. a juridical decision. Yeah. So, so they're saying that uh, that's what uh, that's what. Uh, so it's not unclear. It's, it's very. No, no, no. What's what's and, what's not clear is what it's got to do with liberty. Well, well that's so, what's well, not yeah, clear. But you, but you, you know, you go in and you bring this out. But the, the if I go and just approach the problem with you, say this, you're going to go through the problem philosophically, which Peyton, which you, I'm going to uh, articulate clearly and say that what you're saying is you're going to use meaning to con uh, extant meanings to constrain other meanings. And I would, if I go back and say, well, liberty evolved is a very, uh, we know the history of the word, we know the history of freedom, we know the history of the word liberty. Liberty evolved as, uh, as a more, as, a, as, as saying, the state can't do this. What it was is I was liber, I had liber right to keep my local rules and regulations, my local customs. That's where liberty comes from. But it, what, it, what they say is, I, that's, what it, that's, that's what it means. So when any take you come off that and say, what is the theory of liberty? You're making a new term and calling it by an analogy something that, I, I, you know, I mean, it, it's great, but it, you're just making it out of whole cloth. In, in, in the literature, in the evolution of uh, literature, uh, liberty is, the, is, a, is part of politics. Morality is part of ethics. And politics is simply the moral constraint. I mean, uh, liberty is just the moral constraint in politics that applies interpersonally in ethics. But that's just what it is in the literature. So I don't know why we have to come up with something new. We, these, these terms exist. They're not irrational as they're used. They evolve for very rational, practical reasons that are empirically, you know, uh, uh, they're in evidence everywhere. Um, so I don't know what we have. When you say properties, uh, then you're saying it's free property. Well, when you go back to say your original theory comes in to say, well, you know, I, I'm, I, I feel bad, basically. Well, you have to feel bad because there's a change in state. Well, what's there a change in state of? So it is change in state of property. This property exists, property rights may exist after cooperation is involved, but all animals demonstrate property, all of them. Anything that can move demonstrates I property. I don't know. We don't have property but, uh, Animals may defend uh, territory in a sense, but yes. uh, it was not really property. It I mean, there's no legal institution of property. That's property right. There's a difference between, so this is, a, this is again, a question, which are, yeah. how are you creative defining your terms? If I say yeah. a property right, then I can have it, then we agree with the scope of property we're going to ensure each other is. But if you look at what, and what demonstrable property is, yeah. what do people retaliate against? That's an empirical question. Yeah. What do people retaliate against? It's stuff they've invested in. So, so you can create new things. And, and, and I'm not really, uh, my thing is you've come up with, well, you, you get to the right answer anyway. I just don't know why you need all the justification. But <laughs> it, 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 underneath, underneath it. Wrong word. Or, no, it's not the wrong word. It's a very it's different wrong word. word. It's unlikely that you said the wrong word. Um, uh, the, 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 I don't know why you have to use that, the rationalist framework when we know the answers from this. Is property exists, no, dem is demonstrated. Mm -hmm. Humans demonstrate property whether or not people run. But people don't demonstrate respect for property or property rights <laughs> until they're cooperating. That's what cooperating means. Yeah. I, mean, I have property before, and I, people demonstrate it, animals demonstrate it. I, you know, they, they, if you, they, they protect their young, they protect their relationships, they protect kin, they protect territory. Ter yeah, well, they're territorial. Animals are territorial. Well, but that's all they're able to construct, right? Yeah. Well, in humans, once we start cooperating, we can construct all sorts of elaborate property. That's so before true. Before we cooperate, we can't. Well, after we cooperate, we yeah. can. And, and intellectual property and is a form of property we artificially construct once we're cooperating. Is there a question mark? <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, actually, you did override Nico was supposed to be second this week, and which is a but. I mean, you're new to the meeting, so uh, well, you know, I mean, but, but and you've got something to say. Well, so, so, uh, so well, no, 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 yeah, I apologise to Nikki for. No, no. no well, can I? So, I mean, um, words obviously do have etymologies, um, but you can't really solve 
philosophical problems just by looking at the etymology of a word. I mean, it might be helpful. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about demonstrated actions. Demonstrated. Yeah. These uh, things exist. Yes, property exists. There, I said any, there are any, any number of all kinds of properties uh, are possible. There are an infinite number of possible property rules that you can have. But the only way you can determine out of those infinite number of possible property rules, which ones respect liberty, is by having a theory of liberty that doesn't inherently include... You're, you're, it's, a it's a circular statement. Why do you have to have... You, you said, oh, it's not, you it's not, there's no, there's, sorry, there's, no, there's no circularity. The, uh, the, the circularity is when you have a theory of um, property which is self-consistent and liberty can't exist without the def without the word being used. Yes, of course it can. Uh, but uh, if you're claiming to be a libertarian and that your theory is about liberty, and all you do is ex is is explain all sorts of other things, but you don't actually explain liberty, that that is a bit confusing. It's particularly confusing to non-libertarians, who often have uh, have do have some conception of liberty and want to relate it to so what... So you're saying, you're, you're sort of saying, well, the con we have to worry about all these unsophisticated people out there who don't know this... No, don't no, know no, 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 no. Uh, some of these people are professors of philosophy uh, and they have, uh, they have philosophical criticisms of libertarianism and uh, hitting them with the nap, napping them over with the nap, as it were, doesn't answer their... Uh, their questions or solve their problems. Uh, you have to be more sophisticated than that. And, and, and as I said, I out of the infinite number of possible property rules, the only way you there can just... There are infinite number of contractual rules. I'm not sure there's an infinite Pro number yes. of property Yes, there are an infinite, pretend, th theoretically infinite number. You, uh, you can, I, own everything, I own everything that's red, you own everything that's what blue. Property, what property can you construct? Can you actually construct? Can, can, you phys can you make happen what property can come into existence? In other words, it can exist. We, Not we what you would think of, but what can exist without, without cooperation. Well, just looking at history, we can, we can see that there have been different property rules. Absolutely. And some of them have respected liberty and some of them haven't. And the only way you can say which ones have respected liberty and which ones haven't, if you have a theory of so liberty true. that doesn't isn't tied to a particular theory of properties. You can say, obviously, these rules do respect liberty, and those rules don't respect liberty. So you're, you're saying that the people who issue commands are creating property, rather than that cooperation evolved property. We have property rights we can grant each other morally. We have contractual rights that we, we develop, you give to each other out of the act of cooperation. And then we have commands that are issued to us to alter those, right? Well, I wasn't getting into the uh, sociology of how all these arise. I'm just looking at the fact that there are these different kinds of rules, uh, property rules, uh, and is it a fact if it's unscientific? In other words, if it can't exist, is there it are fact? different. There are different property rules around the world. Some of those property rules seem to respect liberty, and some of them don't. And it's possible to explain which ones do and which ones don't. Yes, absolutely. And it's uh, without. Um, but is pro is intellectual property or the constraint on liberty? I, I I would say that it's uh, it's the most it preserves liberty more than it constrains it. It's most uh, property rules, together, most them. property rules are um, a sort of compromise, it would, you know, in the sense that it would, uh, it depends if you're looking at it from a Hobbesian or a Lockean point of view, but you know, uh, but as, as a general rule, yes, intellectual property, but it depends if that intellectual property is of such a nature that, uh, you're granted uh, in perpetuity a claim for something that somebody somewhere else is going to think of in five minutes anyway because it's so obvious, then it does become a constraint which actually would practically impose on other people. But we can explain the extent to which something can... So the test is whether it imposes a cost on us. Uh, 
yeah, put what, yeah, that's it. And, and, and uh, knows it came up with a very similar uh, uh, interpretation of the Lockean proviso and uh, what he called a minimal sense of justice, uh, where he said uh, more or less the same. If, if likely independent discovery or invention would would, would seem to be uh, the limit, because otherwise you you start to be a nuisance to other people. But I don't see why there's a uh, you need to sort of get into uh, a sort of legal and sociological discussion when you want to assess whether any particular rule respects property or not. Because, because, because could, could we ask our friend to just, yeah. just hold back his enthusiasm for a Yeah, come back no, later. Yeah. Nico, Nico you have something to say? <laughs> yeah. Have yeah. you still got your thing to say? Yeah. yeah. You've gotten it. <laughs> I, can, I, can, I can see... Um, that there is a clash between what what lots of libertarians define as liberty, which is property, and what they probably mean as 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 as, as, as liberty. Yeah. Um, because they, they see these these problems and they try to answer the problems. If, mm. if there wasn't problems, then uh, they wouldn't need to answer them. Yeah. What I don't quite understand is to say basically they cannot call this liberty. If I understand you right, they cannot. Because they, they cannot call I've said, property, uh, property, what, what you call yeah. propertarianism, yeah. they call liberty. And you say this is wrong to call it liberty. I would, I, would say, no, I would say certain property rules are liberty in practice. Yeah, but... That, they, they, they are, that's how yeah, according you... To yeah. your, according to your concept or theory of, of, of liberty. But yeah. what I'm getting at is, I'm just wondering whether you, you are at some point really arguing over words by just saying, look guys, you cannot call this liberty because it's really proprietarianism. And at that point, you, you're arguing over words. Why don't you just accept that like, your version of liberty leads to conflicts with, with, with uh, some, some stuff in the real world. Therefore, let's maybe have a slightly different concept of liberty without them denying the right to, uh, or the, the the ability to actually define liberty. Because I think they, they kind of, they, they try to be consistent in their own proprietarian uh, uh, view. Mm. If, 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 you, if you present them a problem, like you, you did, in, in, uh, yeah. did answer, uh, I think, Walter Block uh, yeah. um, uh, in, a, in an earlier talk, yeah. who then comes up with all kinds of heroes to say to yeah. today. Yeah. But that is an attempt from Block yeah. to stay within his yes. Definition of, of, of liberty. Yeah. So I wonder why 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 can't Block just have this definition and you just criticize it from the point of view? Look, but this is maybe not a great definition. Maybe we could have a better one instead of saying this is this cannot be liberty. Uh, because it's, there seems to be a difference between uh, what, what something is in practice and what it is in theory, uh, and it's a useful distinction. Uh, to make, and uh, if and if you don't make that distinction, and you tie your theory of what something is to, to uh, in in theory to in practice, and you just can't separate them, then when you come up against a, a problem, not necessarily a critic from outside, but uh, what is the libertarian thing to do in this circumstance, then uh, because you don't have any separate theory of liberty by which to uh, deduce what is the most libertarian thing to do, you come up with some sort of a fudge, and that's what Bloch does. He says, well, uh, let's do this and let's do that, and that, that's as good as anything. Uh, look, so, for instance, um, what do we do with a thief? We take twice as much from him as yeah. we took. Well, how does that relate to what is well, liberty in any way? It's, it's a sort, it's a rule, but... But it does relate to his definition of liberty, doesn't it? Hmm. Not really. It's an arbitrary. It's, it's an arbitrary limit. He's, he's, well, you try to steal a pound uh, from me, so I'm going to get two pounds yeah, from you. But because he's, he's trying to answer this question within what he thinks liberty is, I agree with you that yeah. you clash. Block clearly has tacitly a different <laughs> concept of liberty. Well, I'm not sure. I'm not even sure he has a concept of liberty. I'm not even sure that he has a concept of, of liberty, I mean, because uh, most of the time, uh, 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 people who call themselves libertarians 
try to avoid talking about liberty just because they know that they, they can't explain themselves in terms of liberty. They're, so they talk about something else. Nozick doesn't talk about liberty. And he talks about the Lockean Proviso and all kinds of other stuff and rights. And, and, and uh, you know, they're strong on rights and individual rights. And liberty doesn't actually get a look in. And yet they call themselves libertarians. Uh, I think they're right to call themselves libertarian because their fundamental intuition is uh, one of, of liberty. And pe liberty in the sense of people not constraining each other. But, but that is your, so your definition of it, isn't it? Sorry? You define liberty in that way. I, no, I don't define it. I theorise it that way. I mean, that, I think that's what... Uh, what, I mean, that's the Lockean, that seems to be the Lockean conception of liberty. That, as there, there are these two dominant common sense views. Uh, I don't think they're only in, uh, you know, the Anglo-American tradition uh, of liberty it just meaning I can do whatever the hell I want. That's the Hobbesian. Hobbes picked up that idea and ran with it and said, what are we going to do about that kind of liberty? And then there's the other kind of liberty of the leave me alone kind of liberty. Hobbes picked that idea up and said, what can we do with this conception of liberty? And those conceptions are, uh, can be given quite sort of coherent statements and then you can actually do things with them when you, when you, when you do it. But if you, if you won't be explicit, if you start to say, I'm a libertarian, people have rights, and then you start to say, God, then but you at no point link the right to the liberty, then what way are those rights libertarian rights? Why aren't they just but, but rights they from somewhere else? in the sense that they think liberty is property, and that within that it makes sense. It, it's just, I agree mm. with you totally, it leads to clashes, and that's why, that's why yeah. this concept is not, is not ideal, and your concept is better. Yeah. But I think, if, if you're arguing a little, in my yeah. view, you, you seem to argue a little bit over words uh, at some point what? by saying this, this cannot be... No, I'm not, saying, I'm not talking about the word. I'm, I'm saying there is this, this fundamental intuition of liberty as being left alone makes sense, and we can relate everything to it. Liberty is not people not interfering with you. Uh, that it, it, that it's a fairly clear concept, and you can just deduce things from that. And you, sh it, we shouldn't just get hold of that concept and say we well, mean roughly something like that. Now let's talk about rights, or let's talk about property instead. Because when you do that, then you get into the the blocky and mess of, of problem cases crop up, and you just say you come up with something that. You muddle through, you come up with something ad hoc or that, that sort of seems to work, but you've left behind the liberty that attracted you in the first place. And that's why you shouldn't leave it behind, because it can, it can carry on being useful. In the first instance, you can deduce self-ownership and private property uh, generally as promoting liberty. In practice, they help people not interfere with each other and not interfering with each other, that's the Lockean conception of liberty. But when it comes to subtle cases and very new problem cases, things like global warming or the air supply, and that sort of thing, then the only way you can say something more precise is to go back to the original conception of what you were getting at. What, what, when, when you were talking about, you know, leave me alone, as it were, the leave me alone liberty, uh, 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 and I'll leave you alone, the Lockean conception, is there's something that's there, there's a, a, an intuition that's there, which is behind what libertarians are getting at and what makes, and what is so appealing. Uh, in, and uh, I, it's not, I'm not just defining it out of nowhere, it's, it's actually there. I mean, all libertarians I know have this Lockean intuition of leave her alone, whatever, you know, it's, she's, she's not interested or uh, he doesn't want to be involved, so fine, you know. Uh. Bob? Um, some would say um, Rothbard was a poor philosopher but a great salesman, which might be the most important thing for getting a libertarian society <laughs> yeah. into being. And also what an impressive thing it would be if we had to wait until understanding your talk was a precondition of establishing yeah. Now, it may be a very good thing, I think it is a very good thing, mm. but um, what's the purchase, what's the hold on things, just to have a good answer to yeah. difficult questions? Well, uh, people don't have to understand uh, economics 
to a high degree to have a libertarian society either. But uh, behind the scenes, economists will be fighting it out and philosophers will be fighting, and historians will be fighting it out to try and defend either a libertarian or a statist view. And something then eventually filters down uh, and these intellectual debates have consequences. Uh, of course, they're ordinary people may not say, oh, I don't know anything about the history of economics or whatever. I just know that I, I, like, I like shopping and I like having more money. And this, sort of, this thing that they roughly call the free market seems to work and that's okay for me. And this, well, that'll be enough of them. Some of us want liberty. The vast majority of people want consumption. <laughs> Yeah, but you keep, you keep, but it, I mean, it's, it's fine, you know, for, for you, uh, of course, want to speak, you know, it's perfectly right for you to have, have the exchange that you have. But I mean, you keep booking, I mean, he was speaking. No, I hear you. Uh, hang on. Uh, oh. Hang on. No, I think that's actually it. I'm pleased you're doing what you're doing. It's of philosophical importance. But I don't see that it plays very really well in Peoria. So, in other words, no, no, no. It's not. Po it's not propaganda. It's not popular no. propaganda. It's not intended to be. Philosophy no, no, is philosophy. Fair enough. Uh, and I admit that. Um, I mean, if you know, uh, Ayn Rand was probably pretty good popular propaganda because a lot of people read her and become libertarian-ish. You know, if they, you know, they it pushes them in that direction. Good propaganda. Um, it's terrible philosophy. Terrible philosophy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, but it can only take you so far. There are worse. Yeah. Oh, I've, I've been reading someone called Wittgenstein. Or <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm certainly not saying that you, you, need to you have to understand this in order to be a libertarian. You don't need to understand economics or history or anything. In order to be a libertarian, it's sufficient that you have some general idea, and it is the general idea, of not interfering with people leaving them alone as far as possible. Uh, that, and that is some sort of locking conception. If that's your intuition uh, and on, on you carry on from there, I think that's enough to make you a libertarian. The theory is you can go into more if you want to, you don't have to. Uh, there are redneck libertarians and uh, they're still libertarians. Without a theory of liberty? Uh, well, well without, uh, without a thing very explicit. I mean, uh, don't don't tread on me. Maybe as much as it go, about as far as it goes. I mean, you leave me. As Clint Eastwood said, "I'm a libertarian. Uh, I leave you alone. You leave me alone." And that's more or less. Probably he doesn't get much more sophisticated than that. But that's enough to make a libertarian. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to uh, reiterate that point. Um, myself, as a fourteen-year-old, I had the absolute intuition. We should leave other people alone. Yeah. And it was following that intuition that led me to increasing degrees of political sophistication, of yeah. uh, philosophical sophistication rather, and wanted me to do degrees and yeah. meet you and listen to yeah. arguments and get on they want. Yeah. And it was it's been making the intuition all the more sophisticated as I've gone. Other people have entirely different radical ideas and then read a very complicated philosophical argument and then might change their mind, as I think you did and David. Yeah. Uh, but the intuition is is enough because my intuition yeah. at 14 years old was absolutely right. I, I intuited it absolutely correctly, yeah. and every and without any philosophical knowledge at all, none of it was necessary, and all of yeah. that came later. Yeah. The, the, the thing is how to flip people over into your, that your intuition if they haven't got it, and that yeah. often requires exactly. a bit of yeah. Yeah. a bit I'm of not, theory. I've not, been, I've not been terribly good at convincing yeah. other people. Uh, maybe, one, maybe one or two on a few issues now and again. Yeah. But, but our, you know, the English language, uh, as, as Russell points out, has been tremendously influenced by John Locke. Mm. Tremendously influenced, which is why, uh, I suppose, one reason why uh, you know, the libertarian ideas have, have uh, flowed a bit better in the English-speaking uh, world, because Locke wrote in English. So, uh, yeah, but... Uh, yeah, you know, I've recently been reading Hayek's uh, Individualism True and False. It's a bit, a bit hard, you know, but perhaps we could have a, a talk on it sometime, you know. Uh, yeah, but, uh, how far it gets. Individualism True and False by Hayek. All right. And uh, I'm not sure whether he gets it completely right, but he seems to be a bit too Birkin and a bit too anti 
the, what he calls the rat listening. But nevertheless, I mean, he he did say that uh, he found uh, the English speaking world a bit more uh, liberal than his native Austria. And this is probably the reason because Loch has had more impact upon upon the English common sense than, than the we common sense might be in Austria. Fewer Nazis. Pardon? We tended to have fewer Nazis. That's right, yeah. Well, this, <laughs> this, 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 this might be in part due to Locke's influence. I mean, you can never tell uh, how much the philosopher puts into common sense, uh, how much he takes from common sense. What we do have is, you know, uh, you know, there is a common sense which influences us even when we're 14. You know, and this is one of the reasons why I think you got it exactly right. Because mm. you weren't, I mean, if you'd been brought up in China, you probably wouldn't have got it exactly right at 14. No, I, I, it helped that my father was a small businessman. And, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and that, 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 sort of, that kind of ethos is like the permeate of the household, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, that might have been the background for it, but nevertheless, I was the only person in our family who was any, any interest in any of this at all. And, and it just, just came to me, and, and when I was done, I was 14 years old, it just flashes in intuition and go to bed at night, dream, think about the world, and these things just occurred to me as being true and right uh, and important. Mm. It, just, just a quick uh, point of information. Quick. Yes. Would it be quick? Would it be information? <laughs> <laughs> we talk about twisting words and arguing over words. I wonder what you mean by Chris. But never mind. Speaking world, more liberal than the Austrian. What, what year was that spoken? It could have been spoken any time since no, John. No, uh, uh, oh, the uh, Individuals and Economic Order, 1948. You know, the, the essay was published in a in a volume uh, published in 1948, so it's probably a bit before 1948. Individualism, yeah. true and false. Yeah. Actually, a part of the problem yeah. with classical liberals, with classical liberals like Hayek and um, uh, somebody else was mentioned, I can't remember now, uh, is is that oh no, they weren't mentioned. I was thinking it as a popper, uh, is that they are sort of imprecise about what liberty's got to do with anything and and. And uh, in Popper's case, he, he more or less, you know, he doesn't want to argue about words, but then, but then he, he more or less says that, uh, well, as long as you can say what you think, then that's a free society. Well, that is really a weak criterion of a free society. You, you're allowed to say what you think, but the, well, any not, other, any... Not, not this country, then. Yeah, <laughs> but, so, so exactly. He, but he would, for him, he focused his on uh, on you know can you say what you think and, cri and anybody can criticize it and they can't be stopped and for him that was more or less freedom but he, because he was so vague on the on the concept and Hayek himself is very vague on on liberty it, he if he as I mean I quoted um, Rothbard on Hayek and uh, I've sort of looked at Hayek on liberty and it's yeah it is he does come up with this uh, conception of uh, as long as you can't sort of have some sort of arbitrary power over people within certain rules. You know, it doesn't really got anything to do with liberty. You can see how it's getting the idea of liberty in a way, but it's but classical liberalism, uh, the very very vagueness because it did conceive of, of uh, to a lot of, uh, to a large extent as as the, as the state as a problem and intervening. And they were right about that. They just didn't go so much into the uh, the more abstract theory of exactly how liberty relates to any of this. I think the reason for this is that most liberals were not so much saying leave me alone as let me get on with my business, which yeah. is not being left alone. It's being very integrated and dealing with other people. So that might be where the property gets in. I mean, you think that... I'm not sure... Well, you're sure what you think. Yeah. But... Uh, I don't see property as muddling the issue too much. Um, liberty in action is using your property and the integrating of the property of others. I agree. It's completely. It's right. It's just liberty, liberty, liberty in action is using your property as you wish. But, it but not every kind of property. Only ah. certain kinds of property. Not, not, not gifts that the state has given you. And pensions that you've yes. got and, and gifts of land. No, not that kind. It's got, got to be the kind of property that you can get without 
proactively interfering with other people. In, yeah. uh, so that's why I said that you've always got this theory of liberty in the background to show which kinds of property are the libertarian kinds of property. But then, fine, self-ownership and those kinds of property, and then you're off and running and you can, you more or less, you, you can do what you like, and, and, and we just look for externalities. Well, the term might be just acquired. You would say that involves an understanding well, of liberty. Well, uh, 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 that's to bring in, um, uh, uh, you know, either a theory of law or a theory of justice. And, and I, it's, you've, first of all, before you can ask whether uh, something is, you know, just, uh, is, is liberty just? You've got to know what it, is this liberty? And if it is, why is it? So if you, you have a theory of what liberty is in abstract conception, then you apply it and you say, right, if that's the theory, if this is what it, this is, liberty is people not proactively interfering with each other in some way. It seems to follow that contracts, self-ownership, uh, all these things fit that. Now, so these things are, they fit liberty. It's then a, a third level of discussion. Are these things desirable and just? They can't be desirable and just by definition. It strikes me and, and that interference presupposes the property of a kind. Yeah. You have to have something to interfere against. Yes. Yeah. Somebody, somebody, yeah. somebody and you can interfere with, but you can interfere with a. a moving, you can interfere with a noble's uh, land. Uh, you interfere with a noble's land that he's maybe inherited unjustly, or. Uh, you are you interfering with the tax system, which we've always well, had. Interference, uh, and then there's justified interference, or yeah. proper interference, or so, not immoral interference. That's actually restitution. Yeah. Right, I mean, it's just, mm. it's anyway, as I said, if you don't keep these three separate levels clear, liberty as an abstract, as an abstraction, people, uh, as far as possible, not being a nuisance, or however you want to come up with it. It can be formulated in a number of ways, and I'm not addicted to any particular version. Then, what fits liberty? And then thirdly, is liberty desirable? Because many of, of paternalists would say, of course, that's libertarian, and it shouldn't be allowed. So it, it, it just doesn't follow that something is yeah. liberty. It's thereby legitimate. It, 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 they can, so it's, that always has to be a separate question. The justice or desirability of liberty has always got to be a separate question from what is liberty as a matter of fact. And my main point is these three levels have to be kept distinct if you don't want to uh, sort of just be trying to convert people to... Uh, a sort of conf confused, conflated system where you might be able to beat them over the head enough that they, they think they understand you. I mean, they, they do think they're being absolutely clear. I, you know, I get that talk on Roderick Long, and Roderick Long thinks, what, why don't people understand that what we're saying is simply this? And he, he explains it. Well, it's not simple at all. He's actually muddling things together, and he doesn't understand it. He doesn't understand that he's doing it. He, he's... Why don't they just understand that we're against aggression? That's all we mean. That's, uh, uh, there's nothing, we're not saying anything more than we're against aggression. In how does that aggression relate to liberty? And, and it's, you can't just say we're against aggression on its own. It, 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 uh, it's just not obvious because and you've, you're, that you've got a theory of aggression that you've tied in with property rights. In the first, so you've got aggression and property tied together immediately. And you seem to have left liberty behind and made the things, you know, uh, you know uh, inseparable. Well, you can, you can have propaganda on that confused basis and you will make converts, but you'll miss some out uh, because they can see there's a confusion going on here and they, you can't answer their questions. And, and it seems that what you're trying to do is simply is try to avoid conflation and ambiguity. <laughs> That's a big part of it, yeah. Well, it's all right, I guess at the back. <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to give an, an alternative way that's easy. Because really, uh, when you say liberty, you're saying, I want what I want. No. No, no, hold on. If you uh, say oh, we can advocate for liberty, I'm a libertarian, I want what I want, there are other people who don't want it. 
they want they want to they want something other than liberty. If you say, well, well I don't even sorry, I understand you when you say I'm a libertarian. I want what I want. I, well, I, don't, I mean, I, I prefer liberty. I prefer. Oh, liberty. sorry. I I I, I want liberty. I prefer liberty. I want but, liberty. But every, right. But yeah. demonstrably, apparently, other people don't. So, so the question, so the, so it's okay. To, so the problem of centering it around liberty is a very is is sort of just socialist social center the argument around them and neo conservative center center the argument around their preferences. The problem, the central problem, isn't the idea of liberty. The problem is, is cooperation because the ultimate the the, mo the scarcest commodity we have. Is, is cooperation, and it also produces the highest returns of anything else we can do. If you want to experience a condition of liberty, you have to do it through cooperation, because people cooperate with you when they construct a condition of liberty. The problem is cooperation. But to have cooperation among people who have different wants, you need a means of decidability. So the problem we have isn't one of meaning. It isn't one of understanding. It's a means of decision making so that people who have different interests can cooperate on means even though they have disparate ends. So the difference between what you're talking about is, is you're still using a rationalist model that evolved during the, 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 uh, the uh, Christian era instead of the empirical model or the legal model that's evolved since. And the, since the model is we need, we need, we need operational means of implementing an institution that preserves cooperation so people who prefer liberty can have it, and people who prefer to have mutual reinsurance can have it, and people who prefer order can have it. <laughs> are, you, are you advocating operationalism? Um, uh, you have to be able to operationalize, in other words, bring into existence an idea. Um, so when, you, when people use the word operationalism, they talk about the failed operational movement. But operationalism is just fault, part of falsification. That means I can I don't I don't I, ju I don't justify any conclusion. I start with the conclusion. I see if it survives. Well, operationalism is a way of of doing an existential test to see if it's actually possible for this thing to come into existence. So when we talk about these things, we say, well, there's that part. Operationalism is part of critical rationalism. It's how do we how do we make sure something actually survives criticism? So it's a form of criticism. But when we're talking about institutions, we don't. We can either hope to get belief and sim and have people share our ideals, memes, goals, values, word structure, uh, uh, all, uh, all our intuitions and feelings, or we can just create institutions that allow people with different feelings, institutions, uh, different feelings and desires and wants to, to produce them. So I think it's uh, I think it's a great distraction to have people focus on me. Matter of fact, I'm so certain of this. What people want is answers. We've been talking about liberty. <laughs> well, I'm not, for, not, not, for I'm not and focusing it's not on me. Nowhere. So what we need is an institutional framework to implement liberty, so that people who have liberty or want liberty can have it. People who want to have security can have it, and people who want to have uh, consumption can have it. Cooperate because we have to cooperate. Cooperation is the problem, not advocacy of our wants. All we're doing is talking to ourselves. Uh, well, I mean, uh, you set a lot of hairs running there, and I can't begin to chase after all of them. Uh, one of the things that philosophy, one of the methods so of philosophy. You're, you're a rationalist. Of the philosopher types, you're a, you practice rationalism. You only practice rationalism. What do you, you mean by what do you mean by rationalism? Um, the use of language. To, to test other language. Can this, can you say, what well, your basic argument rolls down to is, can I get away with saying this? No. And what, yes it does. And what is your meaning, come, what is the meaning I get out of this? So what does this mean? Does meaning provide no. me with intuition? No, I'm not interested in meaning. No, I'm not is, interested well, in meaning. you're not basing it on empirical results, are you? Uh, I'm interested in empiricism, of course, yes. But empiricism is relevant. statements on empirical I don't base my statements on anything. Uh, but, I mean, there's an awful lot of ideas uh, there, and I, I don't think at, at this stage we can... I'm a social scientist, right? And so I work from institutions... What social science in particular? Well, in politics. Politics. And so now you work... <laughs> right. Data science. Okay. This is what I do. So I go down and I say, well, the problem is, is that there's a difference between people who pursue meaning and there are people who pursue actions. Now, when you can have meaning, the whole idea is to coerce other people, convince other people, to adopt your meaning and your values. The difference between operational institutions is to provide means that are decidable so cooperation can exist without us having to have the same ideas or ideas. Well, I mean, we don't have the same ideas anyway. 
And we never however, argue. however, how, if, how successful well, is libertarianism? How, well, no, well, that's a separate question. But I mean, unless, yeah. unless, yeah. unless most people have some conception of uh, the desirability that you should leave people alone to make their own mistakes and so forth, then you're not going to have a libertarian society. If, right, if, if the vast majority of people wants the NHS and the welfare state, then that's what you're going to have. There, well, that, that, and that's that's monopoly. The problem is, the, problem is the way we've, we've constructed the, 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 the classical liberal model is as a monopoly, majority rule. It's a monopoly. We don't have to have monopoly institutions. There's no reason we can't, we can't have parallel institutions. There's no reason for it at all. Yeah. Uh, there are just too many things, I think, to, for me to get into that at this stage. Are we, uh, yeah, yeah, I can yeah. get all of them, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. Okay. Thanks for. The actual different, the actual point I was trying to get at is, is we you we can talk we can be just another one of those factions. We can be the middle faction, just like the right faction and the left faction, and we can talk about what we want in our model and our terms. But we can understand the problem isn't getting other people to agree with us. The problem is finding an institutional means so that people who don't agree with us want to cooperate anyway and give us what we want. It's an exchange, not a good that we can mandate everybody has, but in exchange, we will. Ex I will exchange with you your ability to do that if you'll exchange with me my ability to do this. That's an exchange. That's, that's, that's libertarian, right? But what, you're not going to get other people to think liberty is good for them. It's not. It's actually, if you look at how we use information, libertarians, we tend to be really smart. We tend to also operate on our own. We do get, but if you look at the people at the bottom of the period, they get all their information and value judgments from other people. They're not going to do it. Hey, I believe. You want a little privilege. What? You are a little privilege. A little privilege. Yeah, you are a little privilege. Well, thanks anyway for your yeah. contribution. Yes, and uh, we're, we're now going to we're now going to uh, we're, we're now going to close the uh, the, the meeting and uh, hope you come to our next meeting. Yes, which will be I Bob Lacey. Long way to get here. You may even wish to give a meeting. Uh, your name's not Kurt, in which case you can expound your chance. theory at length. So. Your name's not Kurt yeah. by any chance, is it? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. I thought everybody knew who I was. No, 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 we don't know who you are. We haven't got a clue until we only we only realised when, when however, the word salad started. <laughs> yeah, you do you do ramble on in, in speech that you do in writing. <laughs> it's like Andy, Andy Rock, Andy Curzon. You know, uh, of course, I, I love Andy, but he's a fellow autist. So we can talk to each other in word salad. You realise it's absolutely comprehensible to one another. <laughs> but okay. It's not the normals. Yeah. Well, th right. thanks anyway, John, for this uh, this right. meeting. Well, it's probably next week, you know, and, uh, and whether we should... Uh...